You might have heard the terms machine learning and neural networks before, but what do these words mean? And how does a neural network work exactly? Well, in this section, we're gonna give a basic introduction to neural networks and generative models. To start, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Roshni, I'm a third year PhD student in computational biology. I'm Rehan Gao, and I'm a first year PhD student studying robotics in CMU. So let's get started. So, how do you make a cat? Let's start with drawing a cat. What kinds of things would you want to include that will make someone who sees your drawing think, yep, that's a cat? Probably eyes, ears, whiskers, a tail. You'd want to make its body cat-shaped, and you might want to make a little furry. That looks like a cat. So it's pretty simple for you and me to make a cat, but what about a computer? How would a computer make a cat? Well, actually, it's not too far from what we would do. All the things we mentioned before, the ears, the whiskers, and the tail, are things that we would call features of a cat. When you're making a cat, or trying to figure out if something is a cat, those are the things you would look for. The computer also looks at features when it's trying to decide if a picture is a cat or not, and when it's trying to make its own picture of a cat. To see how artificial neural network can identify the cats, let's first take a look at how biological neural network in our brain works. So have you thought about how our brain functions when we study and play around every day? Our brain contains perhaps a hundred billion cells called neurons that form a hierarchical network of different levels and function as a system via internal communication, so-called neuron activation. So how can the billions of neurons connect and talk to each other efficiently? Let's see a video clip made by the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University which shows how neural networks in the brain are formed with beautiful animations. Billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. That's amazing, right? Actually, the artificial neural network, or ANN in short, was first developed in 1958 and inspired by the hierarchy in human brains. Therefore, they share common structures and have similar ways of information processing. Now, let's dig into the details. The left side shows a schematic for our brain, and the right side shows a diagram of simplified ANN. Similar to cells in the brain, ANN contains a large number of single computing units called neurons, shown as circles of different colors here. Each neuron then connects to nearby neurons and forms into groups called layers. The connection is done by dendrites and axons in biological neural networks and by algebraic computation in ANN. The connection brings information to the neuron and carries output to another neuron. To 
depending on the position and function in the network. The layers are named differently as input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. Information or data to be processed are passed through the input layer, hidden layer, and output layer sequentially. And the part of the network it traverses is called a path. Along one single path, the input layer and the output layer are unique, but there can be multiple hidden layers to process information or extract features at different levels. Takes the CAD classification task as an example. The input to the brain or AAN is the raw image of a cat, while hidden layers extract features at different scales, such as blurred outline profile, edges and corners, and high-level semantic features like eyes and ears. The final output can be a classification result cat, representing the category the input belongs to. Now we know that ANN has a structure to capture different input features, but how does each neuron work to compute the result? Real-life machine learning applications use high-dimensional data and matrix multiplications. But today, we will use a simple example to demonstrate what each neuron does and how their connections aggregate to feature mapping. Here, we extract one layer from the network. The blue neurons represent the input to the layer, and the red neurons represent the output. Each neuron or node is like a box and can store one current value, shown as x1 and x2. Each line connecting two neurons represents a scaling factor or weight, shown as w1 and w2. Notice that we have an additional constant value called bias, which has a weight of 1. Let's substitute some values to see how the nodes, weights, and bias affect the output. For example, w1 equals 1, w2 equals minus 1, and b equals 1. Then the output y1 becomes w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 plus 1 times b, which is x1 minus x2 minus 1. We can represent the output in a 2D sketch. The horizontal and vertical axes represent x1 and x2 values. The line x2 equals x1 minus 1 represents the x1 and x2 pairs, where y1 equals to 0. The area below the line represents y1 values that are greater than zero, and the area above the line represents y1 values that are smaller than zero. Did you find that using a smaller network on the left, we actually divide a 2D space into three parts, one hyperplane and two subspaces. The value of w1 and w2 will change the slope of the hyperplane, and the value of b will change the intercept. This 2D figure actually represents the gist of ANN, and we can generalize it to multi-dimensional data and high-level features. With similar weighting and biasing, we can multiply and add different basic features together in solve complex recognition problems. For example, how can we define a cat? Probably it should have two triangular ears, two shiny eyes, two sharp paws, and definitely a mouse with sensitive whiskers, right? And indeed, that finally gives us a cat. Sounds like solving puzzles and quite fun, right? We just saw in the last section what components make up a neural network and how they work to figure out the features of something like a cat. One of the main tasks that these neural networks are good at is classification. This is like if you looked at 100 pictures of pets and decided for each of them whether it's a cat or a dog. 
The way a neural network does this is by looking at all the features of cats and dogs that we show to it and figuring out how to split up the cats from the dogs. Let's look at a simpler example with concentric circles, meaning that one circle is inside of the other. Here are some points making up an orange ring around a blue center circle. How would you split up the orange and the blue points? The easiest way I can think of is by drawing a shape, a circle in between them. Anything inside of the circle is blue and anything outside is orange. A computer can't really just draw a circle like that though. It needs to guess a shape and check if it's right. There are a lot of methods a computer could use to do this in the field called machine learning, but we're going to look specifically at the neural networks introduced earlier. A neural network figures out the right shape in a process called training. During training, the neural network will first guess a line or a shape to split up the points, then count how many it got right, then figure out how close it is to the right answer, which would be getting all of them right, and then try again until it gets as many right as possible. In between tries, the neural network uses something called a gradient to figure out how close it is to the right answer. Let's say it draws a circle like this first. We can calculate how many it got right by counting how many blue points are inside the circle and how many orange points are outside the circle and dividing this by the total number of points since the circle is supposed to separate them. So this guess only got about a little over half the points right. But if the next time it guesses a circle like this, then it gets about 70% of the points right. By comparing the two numbers, we can get how much the network improved in between guesses. In this case, since the number we got right went up, we know that we're on the right track. To illustrate this example, we can use this very cool tool called TensorFlow Playground. There's a link in the description of this video, along with credits for the people who made this tool. If you want to follow along, you can use that link. But for now, let's walk through what we're looking at on this screen. So if we're going to solve a classification problem, the first thing we need is some data to classify. In this case, we're using the concentric circles from before. The inner circle is made up of blue points, and the outer circle is made up of orange points. Next, we have our features. This is what we talked about before for cats, the things that make up a cat and can be used to figure out whether something is a cat. In this case, our points have two dimensions, x1 and x2. See the two axes on the right there? We can use these features to help the neural network figure out how to separate the orange from the blue. Now let's look at the output of this tool. This picture shows the points, with the shading showing how the network is currently trying to classify them. Right now, it looks like a line, which isn't really the best choice, but we can improve that. These numbers up here are the loss, basically how much the network is getting wrong. Loss is a fraction of the total points, so it's represented as a number between zero and one. We want to get it as close to zero as possible, so it's getting the fewest points wrong. Now let's look at the things we can change and play with to try to get the best split between the orange and the blue points on the output at the right. First, we have our input features. These are related to the two axes x1 and x2 we mentioned before. For each point, we can just take the value of x1 or x2 as its features. That's what's selected now. Or we can apply a bunch of different operations on them, like multiplying x1 by itself, squaring it, or multiplying x1 by x2 to see if we get a better result. Next is the number of layers. You might remember these from earlier in the video. Layers are sets of neurons that increase the complexity of the network and let it solve more difficult problems. This is currently set to two layers, but we can change this number too. Finally, here's the number of neurons, just like we saw earlier in the video. Recall that neurons are the individual components of the network that do some kind of computation on the input. Right now, we have it set to four neurons in the first layer and two in the second layer. Let's look at some of the connections between the neurons. You can see that some of these connections are lighter or kind of faded, and some are darker. This represents the weight of a neuron's output, basically how important it is for separating the circles. A heavier weight or darker line means that that output is more important. 
Now let's look at some of the things going on at the top here. We won't really change any of these right now, but we can walk through what some of them are. This says classification, which is what we're trying to do. The network is going to try to classify the orange points as orange and the blue points as blue. Next is this thing called an activation function. This basically decides whether or not to use each neuron's output based on that output's value. If one neuron is wildly off, the activation function will block it, but otherwise it's good to go. Finally, on the left, we have a learning rate and a number of epochs. The learning rate is basically how fast we want the network to train. This value needs to balance going fast enough to be efficient while not going so fast that it makes a mistake. The number of epochs is how many tries the neural network takes. Generally, it gets better with more tries until it pretty much has the right answer. After that, it's not really worth adding more tries. And here is the start button. This will start training the network and let us know how well it can classify the orange points and the blue points. Let's start by seeing what the output looks like for a very simple, minimal neural network. I'm just going to take one input, x1, and have one single neuron. So this doesn't look so great. We can see the points are in circles, so we want a circle, not a line. If you're following along, you can try to start make some changes from here to get a better separation between the two circles. It would be best to focus on changing the input features, the number of neurons, and the number of hidden layers. Can you find a solution that separates the two circles? Pause here if you want to figure it out for yourself. For a problem like this, there are actually a lot of different ways that you could get a network that works. So there are multiple right answers. For now, let's walk through one potential solution. So right now, with only one input, taking just the x1 value for each point and one neuron, all we have is a line. We're not using all of the information that we have about these points, though. So let's try adding the second input, x2. Now we have kind of a diagonal line. This might be a little better than before if the loss is lower, but it's still not doing a very good job of splitting up the points by color. We want something more than a line to split up these points. So next, let's try adding some neurons to our network's hidden layer. We can see that with two neurons, the network is starting to learn some kind of rounded shape that's not just a line, but it's still missing a lot of the orange points in the corner there. Notice how adding the second neuron allowed the network to learn something more complicated than just a line. You could also do this by adjusting the input features, since you can see some of the features change the input so it's not automatically a line. But for now, I'm just going to use the two plain features x1 and x2. Anyway, we're still not quite there on our quest to get properly classified circles, so let's try adding one more neuron. With three neurons in our one hidden layer, it looks like the points are pretty well separated. But the network isn't learning to separate them with a circle. Instead, it looks like it's using three diagonal lines, which you can see in the little neuron images here. So this is more like a triangle around the blue points in the middle. For some purposes, this might be good enough. But what if we really want the network to learn that what it's looking at isn't a triangle, but more like a circle? it might help to add another layer to our network. Now with something like this, adding a second layer with two neurons, it looks like the edges of the triangle are kind of rounding out. It looks a little bit more like a circle around the blue points at the center. You can play around with this more and see if you get a classification with a boundary that's even more circular. By changing the structure of this network, that is the number of hidden layers and the neurons, and then the inputs that we give to it, we can help the network figure out how to best solve the problem of classifying the circles. So now we've taken a peek at how a neural network works to do something like classification. 
but there's way more applications for neural networks, including getting a little bit creative once they learn the features of something, which we'll see more about in the next section. In addition to identifying cats and solving the classification problem, the state-of-art neural networks can also generate new cats that don't exist in the real world. We won't delve into the modeling details, but rather try some online demo to see the results. The category of neural networks is called generative models, and you can find more details online if you are interested. Here we show an online demo that can generate cats from sketches or edits. Let's open the website here. And the left side shows a panel that you can input edges or sketches. And the right side panel shows the generated cat image. We can use a mouse to draw or we can use the undo or clear button to edit the sketch. And once we're done, we can click the process button here and trigger the model in the background. It may take a few seconds or minutes to run the model. And once it is done, we can see a cat on the right. While we are waiting for the processing, the website also introduced several other demos that show different applications that generate maybe shoes or bags or buildings from sketches or semantic map. Oh, we can see that the cat is running. And indeed, we just add three whiskers here and they are modified on the generated image. The website also provides the random button that provides some basic sketches where you can modify it and change the output. Let's try this cat. Maybe um, some ears here. And click process. Oh, wow, that's a weird cat. Um, so we can definitely see that the features map from the sketches to the image, like the eyes and the ears and the mouse. But the coloring, some, uh, the coloring may seem a bit strange or some redundant where they cannot figure out the exact um, semantic meaning of the input and then uh, like give different colors to some random space. I won't ever use the clear button here to try my own sketch because it never works. But feel free to draw your favorite cat and see how the output image looks like. In addition to generating the cats, the neural network and generative models have much more applications. As a final word, we will show an online demo of style transfer which can be useful for artistic design and content creation. So we will go through the website quickly and then see it can how beautiful image it can generate. As you can see, this is an online Jupyter notebook and we will go through this it quickly. So to run it, we will click the triangle here. Let's first set up the installation. It may take some time. Oh, cool. And then let's choose a style image from the options below. They provide five style image here. So here, the style image is something that you want to copy or the style you want to copy to the output image. For example, I really like the painting image three and let's try it out. 
uh, select the image here, click the triangle to run the cell. And then we can upload an image you want to stylize here. So let's run it, upload. So I downloaded some images of Pittsburgh and the CMU and campus. Let's just try a random one. And then I think we can see the image here. Oh, it showed twice anyway. So yeah, that's a view from Mountain Washington, I guess. And we can process the image. It needs some scaling and cropping here to, uh, to so that the input image of, is of the same size in case we upload some different size of image here. Cool. So just a quick note for Jupyter Notebook, once you see the green tick there, that's a good sign. Okay, let's download the style transfer networks. Oh, cool. And then we can run the style to stylize our image. Oh, wow, that's a fast run. So here we can see the first column show the input image. The second column show the style image that we select just now. And the final column shows the output of the stylized image. We can definitely spot the color difference, which kind of structure, um, which kind of uh, indicates the style we want. For example, the, the book sky changed to yellowish and the water becomes like similar to the wavy water here. Uh, well, we can also spot that the content, for example, the bridge and the building behind are well kept, right? We can also try some other image, like for example, I really like this, the, the orangish color in image four as a style. And then we can upload a different free image like the campus. Let's see how it looks like. Oh, that's the same campus with the, the famous tower here behind. And then let's process the image and download the model again. And then run the stylized model. Oh, wow. That's a good match. Oh, did we change the style image here? Not really. Let's see. Shall we run image for again? Oh, yes. So when you see some error there or some unexpected results, let's just try. Oops, I think they miss our image here. Okay. Cool. And then rerun the cell. Yep, sounds good. And then download the model. Stylized image. Oh, wow. Oh, I really like the sky here. See? The orange color is like a sunset thing, right? And then, oh, and the, the Look at the colorful stairs here, colorful needles here, right? It's quite different. And then we can also change the counter blending here. Oh, I see, do you see more colorization on the sky? So the smaller the content blending ratio is, the more style, uh, more stylized it can be. Oh, wow, see, really like it. So yeah, uh, that wraps up for the online demonstration. There are much more things online for uh, neural network and generative models. So feel free to explore more if you are interested. That's it. Hope you have fun and hope you have enjoyed our video. Thank you.